Life is unpredictable. I think all of us learn that. Sometimes we learn it in good ways. Sometimes we learn it in really hard ways. You're valuable to Christianity Today, and we want you to be prepared and protected. And one of the ways that that can happen is by having a will and getting a will together for your family and to care for your loved ones. If you've already set up your will and other important estate planning documents, that's great. But if you haven't, Christianity Today has partnered with Epic Will to easily and affordably walk you through the whole process of creating a legally binding and state-specific will in as little as 10 minutes. You owe it to yourself and your loved ones to take this vital step, and you can get started today by visiting morect.com slash will. That's more than just one O, ct.com slash will. And for a limited time, you can get 10% off. That's morect.com slash will. Hey, this is Kat, and you're listening to Holy Curiosity. Before the episode starts, I wanted to acknowledge the heaviness of the story we're covering in this miniseries. If it's troubling to you, you may want to know more, want to go deeper. You can find a free PDF listener guide on my website. While you're there, you can share feedback, ask questions, and get more information on future episodes. Just go to catarmstrong.com forward slash podcast, or you can find the link in the show notes. Let's jump in. All my life, I've been taught the woman at the well was a prostitute. The picture painted for me at church was of a temptress who lured men with her wiles, and then she bounced as soon as she tired of their company. Her life was used to illustrate why we shouldn't divorce and why sex outside of marriage is wrong. Want to know why this dejected woman was alone at the well, ashamed of her life? She was loose, or so I used to think. What else could explain five marriages and a live-in boyfriend? But what if the Samaritan woman wasn't a floozy at all? What if she was just a desperate woman trying to survive in a time when women were able to do that only with a man's help? Because here's the thing, marriage today is a lot different than marriage in the ancient world. I'm Kat Armstrong, and you're listening to Holy Curiosity, a podcast highlighting the genius storytelling of God from the Old Testament to the New. Each week, we'll explore storied connections threaded throughout Scripture. My hope is that these stories will spark a holy curiosity in your own faith, because once you see these connections, you can't unsee them. God wastes no person, place, or thing. We've talked in depth about Dinah's Shechem story. We've talked about abuse in the scriptures. We've traced Shechem from the Old Testament to the New. Now it's time to talk about the Samaritan woman's Shechem story. In this episode, we'll hear from two experts on the woman at the well. To start, I'm bringing back Dr. Reverend Jackie Reese. You met her in the first episode. To refresh our memory, Jackie and I traveled to Samaria together, and it was on that trip that I connected Dinah and the Samaritan woman story for the very first time. Here's my friend Jackie on one of her favorite women in the Bible. Well, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, is somebody I had been studying for years. And when I say that, I still don't think I have exhausted this story by any means. I feel like I'm still missing so many parts to it, um, which I think is the beauty of Scripture, that you can dig and dig and dig and continue to keep going and unearth more and more jewels that Jesus wants to talk to us about, about Himself and how He relates to us. So, um. I wanted to go to Samaria because I love the story of the woman at the well. I think her story is so redeeming to women in particular, but also to anybody who's been marginalized or lives in a more vulnerable state in their community for a variety of reasons, race, ethnicity, gender, poverty. I mean, there's just classism. And so, yeah, I I love her story. It's like one of the 
longest conversations recorded in scripture with Jesus, and it's with a woman. And if you recognize that only 14,000 words were spoken by women in scripture, that's approximately 1.2% of the words in scripture, and that's Old Testament, New Testament, and the Apocrypha. That's all that we have. As far as women who have spoken, right, we hear their words. Interesting, most of those women are unconventional for their times. And so that means this recording of this story between Jesus and this woman at the well has great significance because it's a long story and she speaks. So yeah, I I wanted to go and I wanted to talk about her story. So tell us a little bit about your message that day. Yeah, so for the woman at the well, which we are overlooking basically, Samaria, Shechem, we're looking where Jacob's, where they assume Jacob's well would have been in general. And that's the story of the Samaritan woman who is hated by Jews, right? There's animosity between the group. And that's why when she comes to the well in the middle of the afternoon, which indicates there's some sense of uncomfortability in her life for her to be with other women. So there's probably some shame involved in her life. And she's surprised that Jesus is speaking to her. It says uh, in verse 9, surprise for Jews refuse to have anything to do with Samaritans. So we know right away there's this animosity between them. She's also a woman who lives in high patriarchal society. Patriarchy is where the man rules over women, children, and actually other men of less social status. And that's the culture in which she found herself. It's also the background of the Bible. It is not the message of the Bible, as Carolyn Custis James reminds us. However, it is the background of the Bible. And this is a time frame in in history in which a woman's worth is tied to her being married, having a child, particularly a male son, and honoring her husband through her actions. It's a time frame in which women have limited agency. They have very little power, position, or status. If we were going to say we rank people and we, we decide who's in the front of the line and who's in the back of the line, she's in the very back of the line. She's in a culture where women would not be allowed to study from a rabbi, and that is because rabbis studied in the public. A woman in a public space without being escorted by a man was considered sexually promiscuous. And so this is interesting, right? This woman comes. You have to understand all of this background in order to understand what Jesus is doing by engaging this woman, right? He requests from her. He speaks, a rabbi. He speaks to her. And a request a drink. And she's shocked, right? Because he's talking to a Samaritan and to a woman. Like, what are you doing? And they engage in this theological debate, which, by the way, is also amazing, right? Because women aren't allowed to study theology, doctrine, scripture underneath a rabbi. And here he is talking about where you worship and where the temple is and all of these things. He introduces her to the Holy Spirit. And so he's engaging her in a theological conversation. What's interesting is her tone is kind of snarky, which so we have to like understand when people like say women should be quiet and of gentle spirit, which by the way is a spiritual gift that it's given to all Christians, like all Christians should be doing that, right? But we'd say women should be quiet and gentle in spirit. This woman's not. She's being snarky to him. And he seems okay with it, right? He's not even asking that she go get a a representative, a male headship to have this conversation, this theological conversation. So we need to like see how we frame women in light of how Jesus framed women, and he has no problem engaging women in theological discussion. It's interesting, when I say she's snarky, I want to say this, like my daughter works and has spent time on the border of Guatemala and Mexico, and then has worked extensively with women who are immigrants. And she said, she had told me, you know, you think these women be so grateful and so like, oh, just gushing with gratitude for the minor bones of help we're sending them, throwing them. She said, they're not. They're strong, they're snarky, they're demanding. And when I, when my daughter told me this, I thought, oh, this is the woman at the well. I mean, she has had to survive. And so she has yes. this bravado to her, if you will, this protection, if you will. So they engage in this theology. And, and finally she gets like, he's challenging all of her thinking, all of her beliefs about where things are going to be and how it's going to look in her religious beliefs in society. And by the way, it's hard to have our theology challenged, and Jesus will do that with us. And she goes, yeah, 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 the Messiah, the Messiah, when he comes, he's going to explain everything to us. And he said, well, I'm he. 
And he basically says, I am, right? And you know this cat. This is the first time he reveals who he is. And this is the title or the name that God uh, gives himself when he meets Moses at the burning bush. And he basically commands Moses to set his people free from oppression and slavery and brutality, right? This is all tied. And he says, I am, right? Like tells this to a woman, a Samaritan woman to boot, this ought to just go, poof, right? Like when we understand the context. <laughs> so there we are on the side of this mountain and we're looking at Shechem and she meets G- Jesus at Jacob's well. And this is significant, Jacob's well. It's mentioned in the text. We should stop and go, why did John mention Jacob's well? And I would say that John's audience immediately upon hearing that they're at Jacob's well, would understand all the history of that well, right? Jesus asks her for a drink from this well, and I want to just read what she says. She says to Jesus, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? And he replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. By the way, John chapter 7, just a few chapters later, tells us living water is the Holy Spirit, right? But living water in a desert is is water that's constantly moving, meaning it doesn't get stagnated. It doesn't get—it keeps you healthy. It doesn't have bad water, right? keeps you alive. It refreshes you in the brutal elements of a desert, right? And so she says—he says, I will give you living water. And she says, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? Can you offer better water than he and his sons and animals enjoyed? Do you hear a question? She's asking, are you better than our ancestor Jacob? Can you provide better, protect better, care better, treat us better? Well, can you, Jesus? This is what she's asking. And it should drive us back to Genesis 34, right? He says, yeah, yeah, I can. In fact, I can. And then he asks her about her five husbands and the one that she's living with that isn't her husband. And I've always heard this story, the Samaritan story, and I suspect many in your audience has also, that this is about Jesus pointing out her sin. Like like she's been sexually promiscuous, immoral, and he's trying to point that sin out so that she can repent and he can forgive. And that's lovely, but I don't actually think that's what's happening here. Um, Again, if you understand cultural context, in antiquity, it was really difficult for a woman to ever divorce a man. In other words, legally, only men could divorce women. By the way, that was also true in the United States in the 17th and 18th century. That was one of the tenets to the women's movement in 1848 that started, by the way, in a church in upstate New York. And I just have to throw that out there and brag on my state. (laughs) I love it. I knew it was coming. It's always good in every Jackie message. I love it. I love it. Go New York. Go New York. (laughs) So this isn't just something that happened thousands of years ago. Like in America, women could not divorce their husbands. And by the way, they did not have, could not have custody of their children when their husbands divorced them. So this is her situation. So when you think about it, Jesus is not pointing out that she's been sexually immoral and divorced five times. This has to be a situation in which she has been left and rejected, Mm -hmm. abandoned. And in that culture, her worth is about being married and having a child, right, and honor. So she's destitute. She's shamed. I mean, this is, she's been left probably in a state of poverty. And I think what Jesus is doing here is saying, I see it. I know what happened to you. I know what's been done to you because of your position in society, because of your status, because of systemic sin, because of individual sin of people who had power over you. They have ravaged you, just like Dinah. And I think he says, I see that. And I think that's why he's pointing out her husband. So this is a story that unfortunately throughout history has been recast as some woman who was loose, when in fact, that's not what this story is about at all. This is Jesus recognizing how people get objectified and dehumanized and treated like trash. I I think when she asks, are you better than Jacob? 
He's like, you're darn right I am. <laughs> yeah, he is. I've got something new to offer you, right? And mm-hmm. that would take us back to John chapter 2. This is a new thing that is happening. A new kingdom is being brought forth, right? And he's offering this to her. So he's redeeming her and her ethnicity, her gender, her position, the harm she's experienced. He's a different kind of man with a different kind of power with the Holy Spirit who creates goodness and beauty And he's offering that to this woman. I'm curious, Jackie, how women responded. I mean, you know how I responded to that message. I wrote a whole book about it. (laughs) (laughs) A great book, by the way. (laughs) The in-between place, like 60,000 words based on the inspiration that happened in that moment during your message and in that place. But I wonder, did women talk to you after about how they resonated with this message? Was there something that you processed after preaching a message in the place? So to have these stories like the Samaritan woman told in context and to give like an oh huge framework, it gave them dignity. I use the word noble, which means to lift up to dignity and nobility as Jesus intended. And that's what happens when women hear these stories in context of first century Judaism versus from a lens that's male Uh, 21st century American, right? Also, I want to say it upsets women because they also think, wait a minute, why haven't I ever heard this before? Why hasn't this been presented to me this way? And so there is also sometimes a little bit of anger and indignation that comes with the lack of being informed of these women's stories. How is this good news for men? How does this message resonate with men? That's a great question. This is a story about a woman, about a Samaritan woman. And it's significant that we understand it's about a Samaritan and a woman because what Jesus is doing by highlighting her ethnicity and her gender is he's saying, look, if we rank people with status and we decide who's in the front of the line, who's in the middle of the line, who's in the back of the line, who's in, who's out, what he's trying to say is this is a person who's in the back of the line. This is a person who's vulnerable in society because of her gender, and because of her ethnicity. But you can be vulnerable in your society because of your race, male or female, because of your gender, male or female, right? Like this is about power structures and vulnerability in society. So it actually talks to everyone. It does, it is specifically about a woman, but he's using that woman to say, look, I'm here to change the power structures, systemic sin that holds people who are, of different race, ethnicity, gender, all classism, all of those isms, because it's not just good news for men, it's also good news for people who are in poverty and how they're taken advantage of. I mean, this is good news for everyone. The woman represents the people in the back of the line. And all of us at one point or another, for different reasons, experience ourselves at the back of the line. Some actually live there all the time. And this is good news for them. Yeah, I would add to that, Jackie, and I would say, when the men in my life who love Jesus read these stories or hear about the connections between Dinah and the woman at well, they look at Jesus as the ultimate example for all of us. Oh my goodness, look at how he responded. Look at what he did, right? He becomes the example, not just for men in the story, but women too. Oh yeah. How do we respond to someone who's lived a really hard life? Well, we engage in a conversation with them. We get really low to be on their level so that they feel like they can be vulnerable and share their truth with us. We give them the space they need to have this long conversation. We go into deeper conversation with them about theology. We entrust them with the gospel message. This is what Jesus did. He's the man in the story, but he represents who all of us can become if we're Christ followers. Yeah, I mean, Jesus, although he's male, is just showing us what it looks like to be appropriately human. And that's for all of us, right? I also want to say a lot of men in these stories are just acting appropriately. Like we we can play them as if they're evil, but the truth is they're just living within their cultural context. And so this is not necessarily stories about wicked men. It's about how society's worked and they're acting appropriately according to their society standards. And Jesus comes in to both women and men and says, oh no, I've got a whole new way of living. Kingdom living looks very different. He's a different kind of king with a different kind of power, creating a different kind of people. 
And in that is going to be goodness and beauty and restoration. That's what Jesus' kingdom people are going to bring forth in society. And so you're right. Like, we just look at Jesus and we go, oh, he's showing us what it looks like to be appropriately human and how to fight against systemic systems that keep particular people down, whether it's because of their ethnicity, their race, their gender, their class. He's saying, no, 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 not okay. Jesus is actually good news for everybody. I love what Jackie just said. Jesus is good news for everybody. And we wouldn't do the Samaritan woman justice without exposing all the fake news floating around about her backstory. That's why I've invited Dr. Lynn Kohick, a New Testament scholar, to set the record straight. Namely, that the Samaritan woman wasn't a prostitute. She was in survival mode in Shechem. More about this after the break. This episode is brought to you in part by Zondervan. Are you looking for a Christmas gift for a child that will last a lifetime? If so, give them the best-selling Adventure Bible. With over 10 million copies of the brand sold, it's the number one Bible for kids. This Bible helps them take an exciting journey through each chapter with full-color illustrations, hands-on activities, and more. Along the way, they will meet all types of people, see all sorts of places, and learn all kinds of things about the Bible. More importantly, they will grow closer in their relationship with God. Now available in five different Bible translations, the Adventure Bible is the Christmas gift that keeps giving year after year. Go to AdventureBible.com to find free Bible trivia games, activities, and more information about the Adventure Bible. Visit AdventureBible.com today to start the adventure. Dr. Lynn Kohick is the director of the Houston Theological Seminary and distinguished professor of New Testament. She co-founded the Virtual Museum of Women in Christianity, an ongoing effort to restore and remember many forgotten or unknown stories about women of Christian faith. She has a PhD in New Testament and Christian origins from the University of Pennsylvania, and she served as a New Testament and Biblical Studies professor at Wheaton College for 18 years. She was the provost and dean at Denver Seminary and the provost and professor at Northern Seminary. Lynn's the woman for this job. She's an expert on first century marriage arrangements, and she's devoted some of her scholarly studies to the Samaritan woman's life. I just really appreciate you coming on the show to talk about the woman at the well, and I want to know what got you interested in her to start and your interest in ancient marriage practices. Yeah, well, I think what got me interested in her was that I felt like she has just not been given the credit that she deserves, or said another way, there's so much about her that speaks to really good discipleship, and instead she's been relegated to sort of a stock figure of what you shouldn't be as a disciple and certainly not as a female disciple. And so I think a lot of it was just, it almost just sort of seemed unfair. Like, here's this woman who gives the gospel message to her town, and they accept the Savior. They call him Savior of the world, an amazing title throughout the whole of the New Testament. And I think, shouldn't I want to be like her? Shouldn't we all? So I think that's what really drew me in. I think that we have layers of misinformation. We make a lot of assumption about this woman's life. I think it has to do with the things we've been taught, so maybe some cultural issues, our own insecurities. But I've got to admit, Dr. Kohick, when I came to her story as a new believer, I think I envisioned something from like reality TV or MTV at the time. 
a uh, woman who had um, a lot of autonomy, a lot of agency, um, could pursue her divorce if she wanted it, uh, maybe was a scantily clad, salty mouth, a seductress that was jumping in and out of bed with men when she felt like it and dissolving her marriage unions when she wanted to move on and hook up with somebody else. And when she, when the woman at the well is presented in John chapter four, I just assumed she was someone like that. And maybe today, if I were reading with my eyes now, I would think maybe this is like someone like a Kardashian or someone who's just ready to move on, you know, get married to somebody else. And I think we have a lot of fake news. Would you agree and scale from zero to 10, 10 being we've always gotten her story right? Where are we on that spectrum? When you get students in your New Testament classes, what do they understand about her and do they get her story right? No, I'd put it about a two. I mean, we always locate her in Samaria, so that's good. (laughs) And usually people talk about how Jews and Samaritans did not get along, and that is a very important part of the story. But I think there's also the religious component. The Samaritans were really convinced. I mean, they had the Torah, the five books of Moses. They were convinced they were the true Israelites. So there was a real contest, if you will. The Samaritans could point to the Bible, the Jews could point to the Bible, and that's a real conversation that even had bloodletting, even riots at the time of Jesus between the two groups. So it was fresh, and I think people sort of get that, but then it goes away as though a woman can't have religious questions or religious thoughts. And John makes a point in his chapter to point out that she anticipated the Messiah was coming. She was thinking about theological issues. This was the conversation, probably, for her whole life about where they should worship. You know, when I look at this woman's life, I used to think, again, she was just really confessing to sexual immorality. I thought she's a perfect example, an illustration of why you shouldn't have sex outside of marriage, why you should never get divorced, why promiscuity is a real woman's problem. Can you paint a different picture? And also, Lynn, why did I think she was a prostitute? Well, I think it starts with the phrase in kind of the middle of the story, which is, the man she is with now is not your husband, right? That kind of frames everything. And then we back it up and we say, well, she was an outcast because she was there at noon at the well. And there's simply no historical evidence for that kind of belief. Women did tend to go in groups, but it wasn't like it's a sign that by being there by herself, that that was a problem. But we start reading all kinds of negative things into her because of that one line. The man you're with now is not your husband. What was it about the Samaritan woman's life that defined her publicly? Well, she had five husbands. That's not a lucky guess. So she's amazed. She said, I see you're a prophet. Again, Mm -hmm. there's no mention of sin. There's no confessing here. It's it's just, how did you know that? If you had said you had three husbands, she'd be like, well, okay. I mean, you know, it's fairly common. But this, five husbands, is amazing. So it reveals Jesus' knowledge of who she is. Then the man who you're with right now is not your husband. Okay, what does that mean? Well, now we go back to the possibilities in the for marriage and divorce and other forms of marriage in this time. We know this woman could not on her own execute divorce. She could apply for divorce, but she had to have a guardian of some sort, some man that would go to the court and execute this divorce. It's possible that five husbands divorced her, but I just find it very difficult to imagine the third man saying, I'll take a chance with this woman. So I think that there was tragedy here also. And because we know from the statistics that I just mentioned, to lose one or two spouses to death was not, sadly, uncommon. So the man she's with now, it could be some sort of leverite arrangement. It's not clear whether that 
was used very much at this time. That would be from Deuteronomy, where this is mentioned. It's maybe the fifth husband's brother agreed to watch his wife. And so she's in kind of a Leverite-ish sort of maybe marriage, or she's a concubine. And I think Jesus would not have considered that to be a formal, good, official marriage. Maybe she's a second wife, which again, Jesus, when he teaches on marriage, talks about the two becoming one flesh. So I can think of a number of scenarios that would have been acceptable at that time, but would not have been God's best for the marriage. But nevertheless, she would not have been seen by her culture as immoral because they had these other possible ways of thinking about a man and a woman living together that they didn't think was immoral. But Jesus would say that's not marriage as God designed it. To me, the real proof that she's not immoral and sinful is when she goes back to town and the townspeople listen to her. Nobody, when she goes back to the village, nobody says, wow, you've changed, right? They must have known that she was a religious person who was interested in this stuff. The Samaritans had written texts. We know that because we've found them. (laughs) So they changed some things in the Torah to not privilege Jerusalem, but otherwise it's pretty much the same text. So this woman would have known what we would call the Bible, just not in the best edition of the Bible. And that must have been her reputation. Otherwise, why would the men of the town go out, having already been persuaded by her that this could be the Messiah. Yeah, they believe her. They believe her enough to go and find out for themselves, which I think speaks volumes. Well, she understands it enough to be able to articulate it to the people in her town who, unlike Dinah's story, where it ends in tragedy, in this case, the town seems to turn to Jesus. She is the first evangelist. It's just incredible. And the disciples miss all of this. We have to read the whole story in John 4. When the disciples come back and they see Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman, they are confused. The male disciples would have experience with these female disciples who are also following after Jesus. So it's not that so much. It's that Jesus is speaking to the Samaritan about the stuff of the gospel. They had just been in town and said nothing. And so Jesus teaches them the fields are ripe for the harvest. Almost never, in fact, I've never heard a sermon that connects those. I've either heard a sermon on the Samaritan woman or a sermon on the fields are ripe for the harvest, but never are those two things brought together. But in real time, as John presents the story, that's the really the exclamation point of the story of the Samaritan woman is that there was a conversion because she saw Jesus as her Messiah and she was believed by the town. You're describing someone we should revere, someone we should appreciate, someone that should be almost put on a pedestal as a great disciple of Jesus, someone in comparison to the disciples who didn't see the harvest that was plenty, went to her town and advanced the gospel through her testimony as someone who had enough credibility in her city to be believed. Like all these things that you're listing, Lynn, you're going to have a lot of people listen to the show and go, why have I never heard that? Why have I believed this so long? How are we going to change the perception of this woman? So I'd like you to address first the listener that's going, this is all new to me. I mean, help me unpack that a little bit for someone who's saying this is all new. Yeah, well, I think if we knew church tradition, she actually didn't always have that reputation. She was seen as a godly woman. There's a whole tradition of her raising sons in in a godly way and, and being martyred. And I'm not saying that that is historically accurate, but I am saying that the church initially saw her demonstrating an awakening faith. I think also the kinds of things that she's used to promote, don't get a divorce, don't be promiscuous, those things are actually 
good teachings that we find in the Bible. So I think perhaps some of this misunderstanding about her comes from the truth that there are some things that we shouldn't look towards, right? Then I think, especially for people today, it's still hard, I think, for men and women to imagine a woman who's interested in theology. And I don't know why there is a prejudice like that, but it seems to be there that women Mm -hmm. as a group are not Well, they weren't for a long time educated in the church. They couldn't get advanced degrees in the church. They couldn't actually be educated in the way that they now can. So there still exists this sense that doing theology is a man's job. And so they're not going to see the Samaritan woman as a theologian or having theological thoughts or being interested in religious questions. But Jesus hangs out with women who are interested that way. I think of Martha. You know, when Jesus comes to raise Lazarus, he's going to be doing that. But right before he does and Martha meets him, Jesus says something about the resurrection to which Martha responds, I know he will be raised in the last day. That's a particular doctrinal position that she holds. That's not a generic understanding of Judaism in the first century. It's not like Jerusalem is God's home. Like That would be generically known at that time. But the resurrection of the dead, that was a contested belief between the Pharisees and Sadducees. And she articulates that doctrinal belief. She is interested in theology. And then, of course, Jesus goes on to say, I'm the resurrection and the life, you know. And so, like the Samaritan woman in the Gospel of John, Jesus demonstrates that women have capacity to understand the deepest and richest theological truths. But the church hasn't always embraced that capacity, I think. Man, you hit the nail on the head, Lynn. (laughs) Why do we have such a hard time reimagining her? Well, there are some things that happened in the Protestant Reformation. We have some cultural issues still happening today. Doors for women to pursue theological education are relatively new. We have a lot of catching up to do. So it does take some reimagining of this character in a story that we are very familiar with. It's almost like we need to become unfamiliar to reread it with fresh eyes. You know, someone else that has influenced me a lot on this subject, you would probably the person who's influenced me the most. And then probably Dr. Day. She's retired from Beeson Divinity. She was kind enough, Lynn. I reached out to her when I was writing a book on this topic and said, your thesis is like $200 on Amazon. Just curious if maybe you have an extra one lying around. And she shipped me one of her original printed from Baylor. It was super neat. But she and I got to dialogue a little bit and talk about the woman at the well. And she wrote something in her thesis all those years ago that said, based on our knowledge of the social and cultural values of first century Palestine, why would it be unnatural to assume that this woman deserves our sympathy rather than our judgment in a society that granted women essentially no social or legal standing apart from her responsible father, man, husband, brother, or son, she can legitimately be considered a marginalized figure subject to economic, social, and legal exploitation. And so the way Dr. Day would position her is someone who deserves for us to appreciate her, but also to consider that maybe she'd gone through a lot of hard things. Now, you kind of mentioned it, Lynn, but I want you to go back to the possibilities. If we can't imagine her as a slutty individual, right, what it is possible is to imagine her as someone who's suffered great losses in life. So you mentioned that, potentially husbands, and could we assume that maybe she had miscarried and that's one of the potential reasons people would not want to be married to her anymore? Was that consistently what was happening in her time? Well, I do think Dr. Day is absolutely correct that she deserves our sympathy, much as we give sympathy to Naomi and Ruth. That would be another example of tragedy happening and where women are vulnerable. So yes, I would say absolutely the sympathy is due. When Jesus says, go and call your husband, I think it's possible she understood his meaning to mean, I know what you've lived through. I know what you're dealing with. I know who you are. You don't have a name here, but I know it. I know how hard life has been for you. I also wonder 
if when he says, you've been married five times, the man you're living with now is not your husband. I wonder if she was processing that someone who finally knows the pain I've been through, what I've had to survive, how eager I am to experience something different. And I think that's why he offers her the living water that to be sustained forever without the need for all of these sustainers in her life. Do you think that's possible? I do. Yeah, I do. I think she has curiosity and Jesus recognizes that and has agency and has courage to ask the questions. She's like the redemption of Dinah, maybe. I don't know. (laughs) What if Jesus' statements to the Samaritan woman about her marriages and living arrangements were not indictments? What if they were accurate representations of her life as a victim in a system that depersonalized her? What if Jesus was teaching her a theological lesson that he knew she was ready to hear and willing to accept? Because she does end up using that message to win others for Christ. What if Jesus was expressing his compassion and concern for the suffering? Wouldn't this make sense for a woman in a place like Shechem? I needed to process all of this with a friend. That's why I've invited Cheryl Luke to be on the next and final episode of the miniseries. Cheryl has spent the majority of her life in vocational ministry as a leader, pastor, and ministry director. With over 40 years of leadership experience, Cheryl wants to see individuals healed and whole, fully prepared to walk in the purpose God has for their lives. In this last episode of the series, we're going to put it all together. How Dinah's story finds literary redemption in the Samaritan woman's story. Stay curious, y'all. Holy Curiosity is a production of Christianity Today. The executive producers are Eric Petrick and Mike Cosper. Leslie Thompson is our producer. Our associate producer is Mackenzie Hill. Audio editing is done by Kevin Morris. Go deeper with me on Instagram at catarmstrong1 or on my website, catarmstrong.com.